Good morning, everybody. And thank you. Thank you for that welcome, and thank you for the invitation to come here today. I've had the privilege for the last six years of leading the only voice of opposition in the European Parliament. As you may have gathered, I'm not very popular in Brussels. They, um, they don't like what I have to say because they, in that parliament today in Brussels, represent an entire generation of European politicians. They've been English, they've been French, they've been German, and what they've done is they have betrayed our nations, they have betrayed our democracy, and they have sold us out to a new bureaucracy in Brussels, and we're going to fight back against them. But there's been a slight problem. I've had colleagues from across the continent who are joining our great democratic struggle, but of course there's been nobody, but nobody, from Germany in the European Parliament standing up and fighting for democracy. And one of the reasons that I'm so pleased to be here this morning, one of the reasons I'm so pleased to be here this morning is I see in this room, and I feel in this room, all the same things that we had when we founded the UK Independence Party 17 years ago. We started like you, with a small number of people and a big meeting. We used to meet, you know, often have a public meeting and 20 people would come, but we followed our crusade, we pushed our cause, and in 2009, in the European elections, we in UKIP came second across the entire United Kingdom, beating the government of the day, and I believe here that you have the potential to do exactly the same thing, and I wish you Godspeed. Now, of course, we are here because our excellent professors, two of whom we have heard from, have decided to take this challenge to the court. And it's a brave thing for them to have done because it takes strength and courage to swim against the tide of the media, of your fellow academic colleagues. I'm sure you've been scorned for much of what you've said and done. But no, you are the visionary people. You are the ones standing up and fighting for democracy. And I'm delighted to be here today to support you. And of course, these empires of political union never, ever work. You know, if you travel across northern Africa, you'll see in Egypt the ruins from great empires that have gone before, right across Europe, right across Europe, right across the world. We've seen the formation of political unions. We've seen the submission of individual peoples to an empire. And all through history, we see that multinational empires and political unions simply don't work. They don't survive. The Roman Empire's gone. The Ottoman Empire's gone. The Austro-Hungarian Empire has gone. They have disappeared. And, and, you know, this European project has been forced upon us. And, by the way, I'm not making this up when I call it an empire. Mr. Barroso himself has described the European Union as an empire. So that is what they're trying to build. They tell us that this empire is a project for peace and prosperity. What they don't tell you is that this project is actually about an elite gaining more power for themselves. That's the truth behind this project today. So they push us together. They take 27 different nation states with different languages, different histories, different cultures. And without ever asking us what we think, they're trying to force us together into one state. And we're beginning to see the cracks at the edges. We're beginning to see that it's not really working, but they are desperate to continue with their mission. On his 80th birthday, Helmut Kohl, who I have to say is not my favorite European politician, <laughs> Helmut Kohl, when he could see that the Euro was getting into trouble, said, European unification is a question of war and peace. The Euro is part of our guarantee of that peace. Well, ladies and gentlemen, 
I fundamentally disagree with that analysis. The I've always believed that the great pivot point of the last uh, couple of centuries, really, was the disaster that was the First World War. And if you go, if you go to Verdun, which I've done many times, and I've taken parties and I've lectured on those battlefields, it's worth thinking about what that place represents. And of course, do you remember back in 1984, the enormous Helmut Kohl and the tiny, and the tiny Francois Mitterrand holding hands together. It looked like a comedy act, but it wasn't because it was deadly serious. And they held hands together and they stood in front of that massive cemetery and that ossuary up at Dourmont, where those appalling battles had taken place, and they said, never again. They said that the EU was necessary to prevent war ever taking place on the continent. What, of course, they forgot or perhaps misunderstood is that mature democracies rarely, if ever, fight each other. So what they were using, they were using people's genuine desire for peace to push towards a political union and to push towards the destruction of our national democracies. Now, I, 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 I firmly believe that the reason that we've had peace in Europe in 1945 is because of a number of factors. I mean, firstly, Frankly, I think people in Europe were sick of war by the time 1945 had come along. And of course, we had nuclear weapons. Now, I know this is not universally popular in Germany, uh, but I do think the deterrent effect of nuclear weapons made a war with Russia much less likely. And of course, what we've had since then is NATO. Now, NATO is an example of sovereign states that group together and form an alliance. I support the principle of NATO. What I don't support is the principle of European Union, where far from nation states working together, what you do as a nation state is you give away the power to make decisions to somebody else. So that's one of the things, ladies and gentlemen, that we've got to push. We want peace, of course we do, and we'll get peace in Europe provided we have mature, functioning national democracies. And actually what is going on... Actually what is going on is very, very dangerous indeed. Because what is happening is we are being robbed of our identity. We are being robbed of our democracy. And if these movements... If these movements don't work, if we are not able to get plebiscites across the European Union, then I am deeply fearful that far from the European Union being a project for peace, it will actually do something that our children and grandchildren may pay a very heavy price for indeed. Just think, just think what we did in the Balkans in 1920 and 21. We took small, different, sovereign, independent states. We forced them together and called it Yugoslavia, and much as it may have held together for decades under a pretty repressive communist regime, in the space of the last 20 years, we've seen the most appalling atrocities in the, in the former Yugoslavia as nations fight to get back their democracy and identity. The lessons from history are clear. You cannot force people together. You cannot create identity. You cannot create nationhood that is something that the people themselves choose. And that is why this betrayal, this betrayal of your nation and your democracy is something that is of such fundamental importance that we must fight with all our might.